Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have comb jellies. Comb jellies are gelatinous creatures that are named for their unique plates of fused cilia, which are called combs. These combs help the jellies move through the water like boat oars. And while other microscopic organisms also have this sort of mechanism, comb jellies are the largest animal with this feature. These combs are also part of the reason that comb jellies are so gorgeous to look at. Rather than bioluminescence, the rainbow light effect that can sometimes be seen on them is from light diffracting off of the combs in all different directions. Many comb jellies have one pair of tentacles, although they appear to have multiple, but that is just caused by their tentacles branching out. These tentacles are used to help them hunt like a sort of fishing line. Aside from this, these jellies don't sting, which is always a good thing. Not that I'm planning on heading into the deep sea anytime soon. In terms of today's list, I'd say that these guys are one of the less creepy creatures we've got going on. In our number 9 spot today, we have the ping pong tree sponge. Doesn't this name sound so cute and sweet, like something you'd want as like a little pet? Well, think again. These little things are not what their sweet name would suggest. The name, of course, comes from their appearance as they quite literally look like a little tree that's growing ping pong balls, but those little ping pong balls are where it all starts. The ping pongs have tiny little hook-like extensions that are there to trap any kind of prey that gets too close. From there, the sponge will slowly consume its prey while still alive. This may not be the most vicious creature in all of the deep sea, but it is proof that looks can be very deceiving. Would you have thought that this little thing would be a carnivorous creature? It honestly was a little surprising to me, personally. In our number 8 spot today, we have the deep sea dragonfish. These guys are a pretty strong contender for strangest looking animal on this list. These predatory fish use their fang-like teeth to grab onto their prey in the dark, cold, deep sea environment. They have no scales and instead slip slippery eel-like skin which only adds to their creepiness level. Similar to the anglerfish, these guys have a lighted barbel that hangs from its lower jaw to attract its prey towards it. These fish really use bioluminescence to their advantage, but they also have another less common ability. Firstly, since many of their prey are also bioluminescent, they have a special stomach that will ensure the light cannot be seen from the inside of their stomach so as to not give away their position. Secondly, they are able to produce a red glow. This glow is thought to perhaps be used to signal other dragonfish, but it is definitely used by them to illuminate and detect their prey. They are the only known fish that has the ability to both produce and see red light, as most fish can only see more of a blue light. So while these guys are definitely very creepy to look at, they're also pretty interesting and kinda talented. In our number 7 spot today, we have the zombie worm. These worms were first discovered in 2002, where they were living in the bones of the carcass of a dead whale, nearly 10,000 feet or 3,000 thousand meters deep in the ocean. The reason these guys have the common name zombie worm is because of the fact that their main food source is those same bones that they were first found living in. These guys love to eat bones, but in their own special way because of the fact that they don't have mouths or stomachs. Instead, they secrete an acid from their skin that dissolves the bones, which frees up the fat and proteins that are trapped inside. The worms then have their symbiotic bacteria that lives inside of them digest the fat in the protein. Here's the thing though, we actually don't know how the nutrients from the bacteria get to the worm. They either digest the bacteria somehow, or there is some sort of process where the nutrients get transferred. While when they were first found, they were chowing down on whale bones, zombie worms are happy to eat any kind of bones that they can come across, and they've actually been observed making a meal out of non-aquatic animal bones that somehow ended up in the deep sea. In our number 6 spot today, we have the barrel eye. This guy is one weird looking fish, man. The barrel eye fish is also known as the spook fish, and they of course get their names due Due to their appearance. These fish are relatively small and they are best known for their extremely unusual transparent fluid filled heads. When these fish were first discovered, there were so many questions surrounding them. At first, scientists thought that their eyes were fixed in place, but after some further research, it was able to be determined that they are able to rotate both up and forward. The fish is usually found motionless, just hanging out in the depths of around 600 to 800 meters or 2,000 to 2,000 
2,600 feet in the ocean. This fish has been known for quite some time, with its first discovery coming in 1939, but it wasn't until 2004 that a photograph of a live one was ever captured for the world to see how unique these guys really are. There also used to be many drawings of these guys, but never with their transparent head because of the fact that it gets destroyed when the fish is brought up from the deep sea. So not that I think anyone is going to go diving in the Mariana Trench anytime soon, but if you do, don't bring these guys up from their home. They're happy down there with their heads fully intact. In our number 5 spot today we have the ghost fish. This little ghost fish was caught on camera in 2016 as it was casually swimming along a ridge around 8,202 feet or 2,500 meters deep in the ocean. The fish is around 10 centimeters long and has translucent, scaleless skin and the creepiest, colorless eyes eyes on any fish I've ever seen. Here's the craziest thing about this whole ordeal though. This was the first time a live fish from its family has ever been seen before. This little fish swimming along, minding his own business, has absolutely no idea that he was a huge discovery for the human scientists on land. There is still so much that is left a mystery about these guys, but any kind of new discovery is most definitely always a step in the right direction. In our number 4 spot today we have the aluminum plated amphipods. These guys are found not only in the Mariana Trench, but also in the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the trench. Amphipods usually have shells made out of calcium carbonate, but the extreme environment in these guys' habitats make their shells basically just dissolve. They of course can't just be walking around naked and shellless, so what do they do? They adapt in order to preserve their shells. After collecting some of these guys from the deepest parts of the ocean, scientists were able to realize that their exoskeleton contained aluminum on the surface, which then led to the question, how did these guys find metal since it is pretty sparse in seawater? Well, as it turns out, these guys use sugar-based chemicals in their bellies to extract aluminum ions from the mud on the sea floor that it ends up ingesting while devouring the plant debris that floats down from the surface. In alkaline seawater, these aluminum ions form what is called aluminum hydroxide gel, which is a compound that we as humans use for, like protecting our upset stomach from stomach acid. This gel then coats their shells and acts as a type of of chemical protection so as to keep the calcium carbonate exoskeleton from dissolving. I don't know guys, I just think that's one of the coolest things that I've ever heard a shrimp do. This is the first known amphipod to do something like this and these guys are now an important part of researching how maybe one day we can find an environmentally friendly way to produce aluminum. In our number 3 spot today we have basket stars. Basket stars are like the Mariana Trench cousin of the starfish and when you see them you can totally understand why. These guys have this same main kind of disc that you see on a starfish, but rather than five stiff arms, these guys have five long, slender, flexible arms that all branch out from themselves repeatedly to form even more little tiny arms, with the last branch usually ending up curled. There is no real rhyme or reason for the shapes of basket stars, as it just depends on how they grow. So while some look beautiful and almost like a webbing of lace, there are some that look absolutely chaotic. You know what they say? No two basket stars are the same. I don't think anyone has ever said that, but we're gonna start. Basket stars are able to navigate around the seafloor by wiggling their arms around, and they also have the ability to curl into a ball when they're feeling threatened by predators. They also do eat, as they have a mouth located on the underside of their disc, and they prefer to eat things like krill, small crustaceans, and zooplankton. In our number two spot today, we have giant tube worms. These guys were totally unknown to scientists until the discovery of the hydrothermal vents because these giant tube worms live off of and thrive in these extreme areas. These giant tube worms feed off of the tiny bacteria that get their energy from the chemicals coming from the vent water. These giant tube worms grow to be around 8 feet or over 2 meters and they have no mouth or digestive tract. Instead, they rely on those bacteria we talked about to live inside of them for their food, like a wonderful symbiotic relationship. These guys can best be spotted by their bright red plume, which is used for exchanging compounds with the seawater, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. I could talk about these guys for forever, because there's so many interesting facts about them, but I'll end off with just one more, and that is that the outer shell of these worms is made up of a natural substance called chitin, which is also the main component component in the exoskeletons of crabs, lobsters, and shrimp. One more quickly, but I swear, it's the last one. These tube worms also have no eyes, but they can sense movements and vibrations, and they will retreat into their protective tubes when they feel threatened. Okay, 
Now I'm actually done. In our number one spot today, we have the predatory tuna kit, one of my favorite creatures to ever exist. They're so weird. These guys are basically like the Venus flytraps of the deep sea. These invertebrates make their home anchored along the deep sea canyon walls and seafloor as they wait for their meals to drift on by. Like the flytrap, when they catch a piece of their prey, their mouths will snap shut until they are finished digesting their meal. These guys start off life looking kind of like tadpoles and they swim around until they find a place to land, which they do upside down by secreting an adhesive to keep them in place. From here, they undergo a metamorphosis and have an incredibly large change. Despite having to worry about its predators, these guys are also very picky about where they live. They need to make sure the chemicals in the water as well as the temperature of the water are just right. And it's also imperative that they stay in place once they find their spot. If they're removed from the canyon wall, they unfortunately will die. The predatory tunicate may seem a little weird, but one cool thing is that they have been found to be useful in the medical world, and they may even have the potential to help with conditions such as melanoma and leukemia, which is absolutely incredible. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have giant tube worms. These guys were totally unknown to scientists until the discovery of the hydrothermal vents that we talked about last time. Like the vent crabs, these giant tube worms also live off of and thrive in these extreme areas. These giant tube worms feed off of the tiny bacteria that get their energy from the chemicals coming from the vent water. These giant tube worms grow to be around 8 feet or over 2 meters, and they have no mouth or digestive tract. Instead, they rely on those bacteria we just talked about to live inside of them for their food. Like a wonderful symbiotic relationship. These guys can best be spotted by their bright red plume, which is used for exchanging compounds with the seawater, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. I could talk about these guys for forever because there's so many interesting facts about them, but I'll end off with just one more, and that is that the outer shell of these worms is made up of a natural substance called chitin, which is also the main component of the exoskeletons of crab crabs, lobsters, and shrimps. Okay, one more quickly, but I swear it's the last one. These two worms also have no eyes, but they can sense movements and vibrations, and they will retreat into their protective tubes when they feel threatened. Okay, now I'm actually done. In our number nine spot today, we have the frogfish. Frogfish are weird looking creatures, but they are also incredible at disguising themselves. They're fairly sedentary fish, and they love to find their home on the seafloor at depth of around 1,000 feet or 300 meters. They range from a few inches to a foot in length, and their colors vary greatly, which is how they are able to blend in with their surroundings so easily. They actually have the ability to change their color if their environment changes, with the process taking somewhere from a few days to a few weeks. While they can glide through the water, they sometimes also use their fins to basically walk along the sea floor. They feed off of things like other fish and invertebrates, and on their heads they have a special modified fin that kind of resembles a fishing rod with bait on it, which they use to lure in their prey. Little does the unsuspecting prey fish know, while it thinks it's about to get a meal, it's about to become the frogfish's meal. Frogfish are able to eat prey that is much larger than themselves as they have the ability to expand their mouth cavity to 12 times its resting size, which is insane. In our number 8 spot today, we have the deep sea lizard fish. Deep sea lizard fish are a small family of deep water fish who are related to the telescope fish. These guys have flat heads and curved, barbed teeth, and they grow up to 78 centimeters or 31 inches in length, which makes them a pretty moderately sized fish. They prefer to stay at depths of 1,600 meters or 5,200 feet, and they are actually one of the world's deepest living apex predators. These lizard fish are known to eat anything that comes their way, including other fish of their own kind. Despite the lack of light in the depths of the ocean, these guys have large eyes and pupils, and their vision is actually really important for their prey detection, as their well-developed eyes allow them to see any residual or bioluminescent light. Not a lot is known about their reproduction habits, but one thing that is known is that the deep sea lizard fish have both male and female reproductive organs, which is thought to be an adaptation to low population density. In our number 7 spot today, we have the ghost shark. These guys are also commonly referred to as ratfish or spookfish, and their closest living relatives are sharks and rays, but their last common ancestor lived with them around 400 million years ago. Ghost fish were once abundant and diverse, but throughout the years that has changed greatly, and they are now mostly confined to deep water. They prefer to live around 2,600 meters or 8,500 feet deep, and they have elongated bodies with bulky heads. They grow to be around 
centimeters or 4.9 feet, and their skeletons are made of cartilage. They don't have scales and instead have smooth skin, and they range in color from black to a sort of brownish gray color. These guys use electro reception to find their prey, which is the ability to perceive natural electric stimuli, and they also have a venomous spine in front of their dorsal fins, which acts as a form of protection for them. In our number six spot today, we have the long tail red snapper. These fish feature a beautiful red color, and they also have very large eyes, which help it make its home in the deep sea. These guys can grow to be three feet or 0.9 meters long and 30 pounds. They have a forked tail that grows larger as the fish matures, and sometimes the tips of the tails have a black or white color on the ends. It takes about four years for these guys to reach maturity, which is relatively long for the fish world. There are a few species of this kind of fish, and they can be found in many areas of our oceans, and they are considered a delicacy in some places and cultures. It probably isn't the Mariana Trench variety that people are eating, however, as that would be quite a costly and difficult meal to achieve. In our number five spot today, we have acorn worms. There are a few species of acorn worms, but one in particular finds its home in the deepest points of our seas. These acorn worms can grow up to three feet or just under a meter in length, and they often have brightly colored bodies. They have cilia on their underside, which are used to glide over the ocean floor, albeit slowly as they travel at about three inches per hour. As they move along, they suck the waste from the ocean floor into their gut, and they also constantly leave a trail of feces behind them, which is a nice gross fact for you. When they are ready to move to a new feeding location, they empty their gut, and then they just drift over the bottom, and they do this with the help of an excreted balloon of mucus, so this whole point is just a double whammy of grossness. They can usually be found at depths of around 1,500 to 3,700 meters or 4,900 to 12,100 feet. In our number four spot today, we have basket stars. Basket stars belong to the same phylum as starfish, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. They resemble starfish, but they have five long, slender, and flexible arms. Each one of the five arms also branches out itself repeatedly, with each branch getting thinner, which makes the final branch quite thin and usually curled at the end. The central disc of the basket star where all of the arms come off of is very distinct. While some basket stars have neatly placed arms that look amazing and beautiful, some basket stars look pretty wild and strange. Basket stars move by wiggling their arms around, and they have the ability to curl into a ball when they feel threatened. They also use their arms to catch their prey as they position themselves in the current of the water. They feed on things like krill, small crustaceans, and zooplankton. Surprisingly, these guys do have a mouth, which is located on the bottom side of their disc. In in our number three spot today, we have predatory tunicate. These guys are basically like the Venus flytraps of the deep sea. These invertebrates make their home anchored along the deep sea canyon walls and sea floor as they wait for their meals to drift on by. Like the flytrap, when they catch a piece of prey, their mouth will snap shut until they are finished digesting their meal. These guys start off life looking kind of like tadpoles, and then they swim around until they find a place to land, which they do upside down by secreting an adhesive to keep them in place. From here, they under undergo a metamorphosis and have an incredibly large change. Despite having to worry about its predators, these guys are also very picky about where they live. They need to make sure the chemicals in the water as well as the temperature of the water are just right, and it's also imperative that they stay in place once they find their spot. If they're removed from the canyon wall, they unfortunately will die. The predatory tunicate may seem a little weird, but one cool thing is that they have been found to be useful in the medical world, and they may even have the potential to help with conditions such as melanoma and leukemia, which is absolutely incredible. In our number two spot today, we have the deep sea hermit crab. Okay, many of us have seen or heard of a hermit crab before, so at a first thought, they aren't the weirdest thing out there. But as it turns out, the deep sea variety is quite interesting. Instead of these guys carrying around empty gastropod shells like the hermit crabs we are used to, these guys instead carry around sea anemones, and it is one of the weirdest looking things I have ever seen. Seen. It looks 
looks like these crabs are missing a pair of legs, but instead the legs have actually been adapted to hold the anemone in place. I don't know about you guys, but I really think this one looks like some sort of disgusting sea spider that I hope just stays at the deepest depths of the Mariana Trench. No offense to the crab, it's just not my cup of tea. In the number one spot today, we have the Daikoku Sea Mount. This sea mount is located in the Mariana Arc, about 325 meters or 1,060 feet below sea level, and it was found to be hydrothermally active in 2003. In 2014, it was discovered that the submarine volcano was either actively erupting or had been very recently. Along with these discoveries came the realization that this sea mount also features a pool of liquid sulfur that was covered in some sort of black coating. This little sulfur cauldron is approximately 4.5 by 3 meters large and is 420 meters deep. There are rising gases like carbon dioxide and hydrogen that are coming out of the pool and they are moving that black crust that sits on top. The rising gases appear like smoke, but underwater, which is super cool. The really cool thing about this little sulfur lake is that it is almost an anomaly on Earth and one of the few other sulfur lakes that are known is actually located on Jupiter's moon Io. While there have been a few other liquid sulfur lakes found on Earth, the one located near this seamount is the most impressive one we have ever found on our planet. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have spoonworms. Spoonworms are a strange looking little creature that can be found in many areas of the ocean, and of course, even in the Mariana Trench. These guys are basically just plump, unsegmented worms that find their homes in the burrows on the seabed. Different members of this animal family can live at different temperatures, but most of the deep sea variety live deeper than 3,000 meters where the water is icy cold. The deep sea spoonworms often see the females growing much larger than the males, and in most instances, the males end up living inside, or at least on the females. I'm not entirely sure of the logistics of that, but it does sound awful. In these species, their stomachs are much longer than their bodies, so their gut ends up folded and coiled inside of them, which I guess isn't unsimilar to human and intestines. In our number 9 spot today we have volcanic glass. Did you know that there are volcanoes underwater, even in the deep sea? Right near the Mariana Trench in 2015, scientists found evidence of what was the deepest ever known volcanic eruption. They didn't catch the actual eruption, but they knew it had happened because of the volcanic glass they found 3 miles or 4,800 meters below the sea. This discovery was huge because it is not often that we find deep sea volcanic eruptions, but it was the first time scientists had found one that had erupted very recently. The volcanic glass is created because of the hot magma coming into contact with the icy cold waters, which cools it down quickly. This discovery helped scientists understand what happens when an eruption occurs underwater, such as how some quick moving creatures find their home in the aftermath almost immediately. It is said that around 80% of the world's volcanic eruptions occur under the water, and it's still something we know so little about, so this discovery gave us an incredibly important look at what happens afterwards. In our number 8 spot today we have the sea cucumber. Sea cucumbers are creatures that can be found all over the oceans on our earth, even in the most extreme environments such as the Mariana Trench. These guys have many different appearances, but they all look somewhat like a giant worm or some kind of spiky, slimy cucumber. They're often called the vacuum cleaners of the ocean as they mainly feed on tiny particles of algae or microscopic marine animals, and they play a vital role in recycling marine nutrients. They have a bunch of little tentacles that they use to eat, and they can often be found on or close to the sea floor. There are a few species of sea cucumbers that can swim, but not all of them do. In some species, their tentacles are even able to secrete a mucus net that can be used to trap small planktonic organisms. One really crazy thing about some kinds of sea cucumbers is that they can expel their internal organs when threatened. This would seem like a huge problem, but sea cucumbers can regenerate their organs quite quickly after. They also don't have a brain, which I felt like was important to include. I guess maybe if we take our brains out, then can we regenerate our own? organs? Uh, 
I'm just joking, obviously. In our number seven spot today, we have rat tails. These fish are usually fairly large, and while most species belonging to this family are deep sea fish, there's one specific species that are found in the Mariana Trench. These fish have larger heads and eyes, but then their body tapers out into a thin tail fin, which is how they got their common name. Rat tails are one of the most common deep water fish, and they like to snack on things like smaller fish, some kinds of crustaceans, and even sometimes lantern fish. These fish are great scavengers, which is an important part of the deep sea ecosystem. When these fish are young, they tend to stay in more shallow water, but as they grow older, they migrate further into the icy cold depths of the sea. In our number six spot today, we have barophilic bacteria. This bacteria is characterized by its preference for an environment with pressure greater than our atmospheric pressure, which of course makes the trench a perfect candidate for a home. These bacteria have been isolated from deep sea environments and found to grow rapidly at low temperatures and high pressures. This low temperature, high pressure combo that is found in the deep sea environment is usually the cause for the decrease of the fluidity of lipids, as well as the depression of the function of biological membranes. But this doesn't happen in this bacteria, which has led to the theory that they must have some sort of mechanism that allows their lipids to adapt to their extreme environment. Aside from their superpower, these bacteria help to support life by being a source of carbon for the deep sea animals that end up ingesting them. In our number five spot today, we have immense pressure. In every part of this video series, I have talked about the extreme environment that is the Mariana Trench and just how much pressure exists down there, but I haven't taken the time to really dive into just how much pressure is down there. So we're going to do that now. The deeper you go into the ocean, the more pressure you'd feel. Close to the surface of the ocean, we're sitting at a base of one atmospheric pressure, but when you go just 10 meters deep, that number already doubles. Considering the Mariana Trench is 11,000 meters deep, this is obviously going to increase greatly. The pressure causes the air in your body to compress, and the deeper you go, the more dense the water becomes. While the concept of the increasing pressure is easy to understand, understand, it truly is really hard to conceptualize how this change happens and just how deep this trench really is. One atmospheric pressure is 1.01325 bars, which is the unit used to measure pressure. So like I mentioned before, this is where we are sitting when close to the surface of the ocean, but in the depths of the Mariana Trench, that number skyrockets to 1,086 bars, which apparently would be the equivalent of 100 elephants standing on you. So it's suddenly making a lot more sense as to why people don't journey down to the Challenger Deep very often. In our number four spot today, we have arrowtooth eels. The arrowtooth eels that reside in the Mariana Trench are a species that not much is known about. These eels range somewhere from 23 to 160 centimeters or 9.1 to 63 inches in length. They are bottom dwelling fish and can be found in waters around 3,700 meters or 12,000 and 100 feet deep. They can be told apart from other eels in their early stages because of their telescopic eyes during the larva stage. These guys like to feed on the scraps left over from other larger fish meals as well as invertebrates, but they have also been known to be partly parasitic as they sometimes burrow into the flesh of other fish. Here's a little clip of one swimming past a camera that is located around 11,000 meters deep in the sea. In our number three spot today, we have the hydrothermal vents. The Mariana Trench is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is a tectonically active region where plates are colliding and causing subduction, which is how the trench itself was formed. Through this tectonic activity, as seawater seeps downwards through the oceanic crust, it gets really hot and becomes very rich in chemicals. This leads to the water becoming so buoyant that it comes back out of the surface of the sea floor, and this is what is called a hydrothermal vent. The water coming out of the vent is that same super hot, super chemically rich water, and it is an extremely important part of underwater ecosystems. The water from the vent is highly acidic and hot, while the water in the depths of the ocean is slightly basic and freezing cold. There are many different smaller species who come to the vent areas because of the chemicals in the water, as well as the heat, which helps certain types of food sources grow, which they then want to consume. This then leads to it being a feeding hot 
spot as larger predators can also come to the vent to feed on the other smaller organisms that are already in the feeding area. There are usually a high amount of animals found in the area of a hydrothermal vent, but not a wide variety of different animals as the temperature extreme is not suited for everyone in the deep sea. In our number 2 spot today we have vent crabs. Okay, so to piggyback off of the last point, we have a creature that loves the hydrothermal vents, and that is the aptly named vent crab. These white crabs are actually endemic to hydrothermal vents, and they were first described in 1980. The crabs in this family are usually blind and abundant. In fact, their numbers are so vast that scientists often use the clusters of them to help find the location of the hydrothermal vents. The eyes of vent crabs change throughout their life, which helps them adapt to their environment. Young vent crabs usually have eyes that would be comparable to their shallow water companions, but upon metamorphosis, their eyes degenerate and become naked retinas. Hydrothermal vents produce light in the infrared wavelengths, and this change in the vent crab's eyes actually allows them to better see this light, although it causes them to not be able to see most other things. It's like a similar concept to night vision goggles. So basically, vent crabs have night vision, I guess? It is so interesting to see and learn about how these deep sea creatures adapt to their individual environments and circumstances. Vent crabs often eat tiny organisms and bacteria, which is another reason they thrive near the vents. In our number one spot today, we have giant isopods. Before I dive into this number one point, make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far. It really helps us out. Despite their appearance, these guys are neither aliens or pill bugs and are just another one of those strange and weirdly large deep sea creatures. These rather large crustaceans can reach lengths of around 15 inches, and while that's not the biggest deep sea creature out there, that's still pretty insane for the isopod world. These guys get their size from what is known as deep sea gigantism, which is an evolutionary tendency for deep sea creatures to grow larger than their shallow water counterparts. It isn't exactly clear why this happens, but it does, and is seen in a few different species, such as those giant shrimps we were talking about last time. It is thought that it may be due to the cold temperatures, which may increase cell size and lifespan, which both may lead to increased body size. Giant isopods are related to wood lice, albeit distant cousins, which is why they look kind of similar. These guys are scavengers who usually wait to collect the scraps of whatever is left over from another predator's meal, whether those leftovers are located on the sea floor or if they're falling from the waters above like sea snow. Mm -hmm. 